Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Al Somer, and I have the distinct pleasure of chairing the Vision Prize Jury for the Champlain Mo Foundation. Uh, Lenore Beleza, president of the foundation, who's sitting all the way to uh, my left, will uh, say some words at the end of uh, this presentation. The Champlain Mo Vision Award recognizes fundamental discoveries in vision research and on alternate years, innovative service programs for the prevention of blindness in the developing world. Both awards carry a stipend of 1 million euro, which is meant to assist the recipient in furthering the work for which they are being recognized. The 2011 award, which we celebrate today, was bestowed on the recipients at a special ceremony in Lisbon that was presided over by Portugal's president and prime minister. Last year at Arvo, we celebrated an important series of research breakthroughs. This, the sixth year of the award, recognizes the translation of scientific discoveries into effective policies and programs. The jury received 64 nominations from 37 different countries. Making a difference takes more than simply having a great idea or discovery. It takes dedication, inventiveness, and persistence. Onchocerciasis, or it is more popularly known, river blindness, is one of the most socially devastating causes of blindness in Africa. It is spread by the appropriately named Simulium damnosum, a nasty black fly that breeds in fast-running streams. People living in infected areas can be bitten hundreds of times in a single day, and each bite can transmit the filarial worm Onchocerca volvulus. These tiny worms grow and mature within the infected person and release millions of microfilaria that invade the skin, causing chronic excruciating itching, and the sky, causing inflammation that eventually leads to blindness. The social impact is enormous. Whole villages, often in the most fertile and productive valleys, have been abandoned as valleys of the blind. Inevitably, population pressures cause these valleys to be re-inhabited as people need to farm and consider blindness a myth. Life goes well for 20 or 30 years, after which increasing loads of microfilaria in the population devastates its older members and the valley is once again abandoned. Control and eradication of river blindness by destroying the fly that carries it was the first health problem ever to receive World Bank support because its control would dramatically improve agricultural productivity. Success was achieved by the centralized Onchocerciasis Control Program, or OCP, in the upper Volta area of West Africa by killing the flies that bred in the exposed streams. But elsewhere in Africa, where streams were smaller and fly control impossible, the disease flourished unchecked until it was discovered that a single tablet of ivermectin, a drug originally designed for the animal husbandry market, could prevent the release of the microfilaria and the damage they caused for an entire year. Merck Pharmaceutical made its now famous pledge to provide, quote, as much ivermectin as was needed for as long as it was needed, end quote, for those impoverished populations that could never afford to buy it. This happens to be the 25th anniversary of the Mectazan donation program. These scientific insights and Merck's philanthropic pledge are the stuff of news reports and awards. They've appropriately received worldwide attention and honors. But having a useful and powerful drug is only the beginning of a public health battle. Drugs must be delivered to everyone who need them in the appropriate dose. This is where the going gets tough where the media pay little attention, and where honors and awards are rarely bestowed. Getting to the drug to each of the millions of people who need it each year became the great challenge. Publicly funded health systems are notoriously poor and ineffective in sub-Saharan Africa, even in its main cities. But to make matters worse, river blindness is a disease of rural areas. Worse still, it is a disease at the end of the road where formal transportation does not exist and government health workers rarely venture. Distribution was a daunting task. Without distribution to those who most needed it, 
the miracle drug was entirely worthless. Thus was APOC, the African Program for Onchocerciasis Control, born. Necessity in this instance was the mother of both invention and commitment. APOC is a region-wide scheme for coordinated drug distribution that empowers villagers to design programs that work best for them. They choose the local volunteers who are trained to deliver the tablets, local villages who have rarely received any formal healthcare education solve their own problem. This unique approach, dubbed Community Directed Treatment with Ivermectin, or CDTI for short, has proved to be a revolutionarily successful strategy. Indeed, a model for delivering other health interventions like vitamin A and anti-malarial bed nets. In its 16 years of operation, APOC has dramatically reduced the risk of river blindness in 19 countries across sub-Saharan Africa and now treats over 55 million people every year. Given sufficient time and resources, river blindness may one day be eliminated as a public health problem, if not eradicated entirely. It is this remarkable community-led effort and its many supporters around the world that we honor with this year's Champalimau Vision Award. With us today is Dr. Uche Amazigo, who directed the program for six years. Her successor, Dr. Paul Sampson Lusamba de Casa, who directs it today, was unable to be with us. Please join me in congratulating APOC on its richly deserved receipt of this year's Champalimau Vision Prize. Dr. Amazigo will describe APOC's plans and activities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say that, um, first of all, on behalf of 146,000 communities in sub-Saharan Africa fighting river blindness, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, starting with the president of the Champolimo Foundation and the chair of the international jury and the staff and president, executive director, vice executive director of AVO. Thank you for inviting of me. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to tell a story, a story of how the poor is defeating a scourge in Africa, something that was never dreamt of, that poor people can do something, can be part of the solution. As Professor Sommer said, fighting river blindness has not been an easy task. But let's see how this partnership and the poor people have been trying to do this in the last 16 years. I would like to look at the research component and how that translates into policy but first, just a slide to show you this neglected tropical disease that causes not only blindness, but unrelenting itching and rashes and prevents women from even continuing with breastfeeding for up to nine months. 120 million people in Africa are at risk in 30 countries. And the pre uh, uh, condition, as you know, as you've been told, we have socioeconomic problems attached to river blindness. School dropout rate was up to three times higher among children whose parents have skin disease. And more than 50% of males over 40 years of age were blind before the control program started. And the first one, as you heard, was the OCP which had no drugs, no other tool, but to spray insecticides at the river basins. But that was very, very costly, as you will see later. Then came the breakthrough, the unprecedented donation of the MEC, and that providing mectizan, which we call ivermectin as well, for as long as it's needed, and to as many people as need mectizan. But then, there was the mechanism. Then began the challenge. 
the first study was the importance of skin disease and I was very fortunate to be the one to present this study to the world that onchocerciasis or river blindness does cause blindness but before you become blind it has already destroyed your skin causing unrelenting itching and the TDR WHO picked up this study validated it in a multi-country study and that formed the scientific basis for the launching of APOC. APOC, what is APOC? A broad and well-defined partnership a coalition of today 146,000 local communities, 19 African governments, ministers of health, 20 donor countries and organizations, 15 non-governmental development organizations, the pharmaceutical company Merck, which keeps supporting APOC and has pledged to continue to support the poor, research institutions such like TDR, Liverpool School, or Rotterdam University. APOC has 20 countries, OCP 11, and that means 30 African countries suffer under the scourge of river blindness. And the objective of APOC is to establish sustainable control programs. We will explain why we need this sustainable control program, simply because the drug has to be taken every year for a considerable number of years, and so we need to put a sustainable system in place. Now, for APOC partners, the secret behind their success, I would say, is this slide, is the information here. APOC and partners invest a lot in research, and all policy decisions are made from research evidence, scientific evidence. Then that moves on to implementation by communities supported by the Ministry of Health, the non-governmental development organizations, with funding from the trust fund which is managed by the World Bank, the donor trust fund. And then whatever problem we have in the field, we present to the board that encourages or assigns one of the research institutions, in particular WHO TDR, which is the technical arm of APOC, to move into research and find the solution. With that evidence, then the board makes a decision. So let us look now at the challenges that APOC has faced in the last 16 years and how those challenges were now um, dealt with. There are several key studies that has led to the success of APOC, but I will highlight only five, those ones in red, as we move on, because there will be no time to look at all the 11 studies. The first challenge when we had the drug was here is the mechanism. How do we find communities in greatest need? Where are those communities? APOC and TDR and OCP went into disease mapping in sub-Saharan Africa. All the black dots you see on that map of Africa are villages that were visited. Almost 500,000 people were examined, searching for the presence of nodal for river blindness. And that's a huge achievement because that led APOC now to determine the population at risk over 100 million people in 19 countries and then those heavily infected as well. So all, this, all the red bars, all the red colors, dark, the darker, that means the endemicity level is much is higher than 60%. But all the red colors show the, the communities or villages that are highly endemic for river blindness in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see all the countries that are listed there. The second challenge then came. We have identified the areas that need ivermectin. We know that these areas are very remote areas. Which delivery method is capable of eliminating onchocerciasis. How do we reach those people in the remote areas, most of them beyond the end of the road, in the most impoverished communities where there are no roads, no doctor, no health information? Where do we get, how do we get to them? And that led to a simple study that, you know, asked the question, can communities design themselves a distribution system that is applicable, feasible, sustainable, and or would 
we continue to depend on the health systems when we know the health systems in sub-Saharan Africa is very weak. So we designed a study, TDR, supported by APOC, OCP, and African scientists designed a study that asked just a simple question. Let us compare a strategy designed by the, com the health system for the communities with a strategy designed by the community themselves. Amazingly, we found that if we allowed community to design the strategy of drug distribution themselves, the result was, the, the coverage was much, much higher than that designed for them by the health system. And that led to what you know today as community-directed treatment with ivermectin, a health intervention that is undertaken at community level under the direction of the community itself. It is today also called community-directed intervention. In 1997, this research was presented to the board of APOC, and having seen the value and the results, the board adopted it, the CDTI, as the principal control strategy of APOC for drug distribution. Why engage the communities? I've already talked a little bit about this. First of all, we needed to do something different because we have the weak health system. We had to achieve the objective of APOC to eliminate ONCO in Africa. We need to provide access to poor people and also reach the high need areas in Africa and reduce the cost of distribution because OCP was extremely high. And of course, in, in the APOC countries, we have the forest areas and because we have the forest, we could not use helicopters to spray the river basins as OCP did because OCP was more or less focusing on the savannah part of Africa and that was not possible for the APOC countries. So the drug came timely and very useful to us. Here I just present some of the villages, how we get to those villages behind, beyond the end of the road. And here you have slides from South Sudan, from Nigeria, from DRC, from Chad. In many of these areas, the APOC communities are, at least 20% of them, are beyond, more than 20 kilometers far from the nearest health facility. Having adopted the strategy, we decided that each partner in, the, in this APOC partnership whether it's community donor, must have clearly defined objective. And so the communities were approached and uh, asked if they would like to enter into this partnership, and their contribution was also discussed with them. And the communities collect drugs, they collect the ivermectin, they decide where and when. So it's really empowering the communities to make decisions, authorizing them to decide where and when to distribute ivermectin, to select their own distributors who, will now, who are now trained by the health service, and, and the health workers and the NGDOs. And today we have more than half a million ivermectin distributors uh, selected by their peers. And these distributors, if you look at the slide, you will see that in, before APOC launched the, the CDTI strategy in 1997, ivermectin distribution by the NGDOs and the ministries of health could not exceed 1 million persons treated per year. Immediately, we empowered the communities, and this strategy was adopted in 1997 you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that the communities now, by their involvement, increased coverage. And today, community distributors in 2010 treated almost 76 million people. More than 1.8 billion tablets have been distributed by community-selected distributors and cumulatively 522 million treatments since the inception of APOC strategy in 1997. So thanks to the involvement of the communities, we can now move much higher and much better than we had planned. Now, this is the pre-control endemicity slide which I showed you earlier. Now, if you look at this, you see that 
community ivermectin treatment has covered almost all the red areas. You can only see less than 5% of the total uh, endemic areas in Africa um, are not receiving ivermectin. And the reason being that those 5% areas or a little more than 5% are in post-conflict uh, areas like South Sudan or DRC. And so sometimes it's very difficult for distributors to maintain coverage there. Now, if you involve the communities in ivermectin distribution, the study has shown that you will be distributing, you will be spending 58 cents per treatment if you engage the communities. If you engage the health, if you, without engagement of the communities, the program will be spending 73 cents at least, and that is only for the uh, stable countries. The fragile states, they will spend more than $1.50 if we do not involve the communities in this distribution. Here I would like to share with you a slide from the World Bank, you know, showing the difference between what OCP did using helicopters and spraying insecticide, almost $1 billion spent for 11 countries only. Now with APOC and involvement of communities, $202 million. You can see the huge difference and what involving the poor means to control programs. Now, the impact of APOC work on, for example, low vision, without the APOC, the, in the, the incidence of low, the uh, cases of low vision would be increasing by 2020 to this uh, you know, height. But with APOC, you see that it slows down and perhaps we'll get it to zero or to uh, uh, an acceptable level by 2020. Now, the third challenge which brought another research is in 1999, we had three deaths in Cameroon linked to ivermectin. And so the partners, again, the board of APOC decided that we need research to find out how to deal with the issue of loa loa, that is an eye worm. And when people who have this eye worm and river blindness parasites together and a load of it, then um, it can cause, uh, lead them to coma and to death. So there was now this research um, to look at again how to deal with the eye worm and continue with ivermectin distribution in these five countries where eye worm is highly endemic. And here, EPOC, in, by 2010, we mapped almost the whole of sub-Saharan Africa looking for areas that are highly endemic with eye worm in order to allow partners, particularly those that are involved in LF, uh, distribution of abendazole, treatment for all the NTDs to know where to be more cautious in distributing ivermectin. And this map shows the geographical distribution of eyeworm for Africa. Again, research is helping the EPOC partners and the NTDs to at least reach areas where a couple of years ago it was impossible to start distributing ivermectin in those areas. The fifth research is how effective when we realized, and the other partners, the board, the, 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 the scientific community realized that the community-directed treatment, the network set up by APOC in many countries, the over 500,000 distributors could do more, perhaps could distribute more. Program managers themselves began to use them to identify cataract patients, to use the community people even to distribute vitamin A the board decided that we cannot go into this without a formal policy and we need research. So the TDR was again commissioned to undertake research on the effectiveness to determine the extent to which community-directed intervention process can be used in an integrated manner to deliver other interventions that are more complex that are that, than delivering ivermectin. And here we look at the, the, the effectiveness of using this strategy in treating children under five with fever. You can see that the roll, rollback malaria target was surpassed in 2000, uh, two years after the adoption of CDTI. 
even ivermectin distribution increases in coverage if you combine the distribution of ivermectin with vitamin A or with abendazole. So all, that, all the other programs benefit and the, the study concluded that at least four to five interventions could be effectively implemented using the community directed intervention approach. Now the board then approved that APOC can use its fund, trust fund, to support countries to distribute just more than ivermectin in order to bring more commodities like bed nets and bendazole, praziquantel to communities beyond the end of the road, having established the network on how to reach those. And today, you can see that over 50 million people received ivermectin and other uh, uh, health interventions in 2010. And here you can see 12.7 million and then the, the other interventions follow. Now, having said all that, we still had not achieved our aim. We were always being questioned. When will you stop? Because the communities were, after 10 years, began to see that they had no itching anymore. They did not want to continue to take ivermectin. And the question is, how long are we going to continue to take this drug? My skin is beautiful now. I don't have rashes. I don't have itching. I can thread the needle much better than I used to do because of ivermectin. You have this wonder drug, because that's the name they call ivermectin in many of our communities, the wonder drug. Now, how do, when do we stop treatment and where do we stop treatment? That was the question that we had to answer and that is where APOC is today and this series will end my presentation. The feasibility of eliminating onchocerciasis infection and transmission with ivermectin alone. In 2006-2007, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation accepted the proposal from TDR engineered by APOC to uh, undertake a multi-site study in Mali, Senegal. And there, this study, very important study, coordinated by Dr. Reme, uh, found that in those communities where ivermectin had alone had been given by distributors for up to 18, 19 years, there was zero infection in humans, no parasites. Today, the, the further in addition to that, they looked for a parasite in the flies and there was zero infection in flies. An amazing story. And after that, we decided in APOC to also look in APOC countries because Mali, Senegal is OCP countries. So we thought the best thing would be to look in APOC countries and Kaduna in Nigeria was one of the oldest projects where we started asking community people to distribute ivermectin themselves to plan and manage it. And so uh, we were too pleasantly surprised to see that in more than 3,000 people skin snipped, almost 4,000 people skin snipped in 2008 in Kaduna, there was zero infection in them. And that turned the tide for APOC. And that began a new phase, a new page in the life of APOC partners. Of course, with the blessings of the communities, we think we will get there. So the board approved from that 2008 that we should now begin to look at APOC not only as a control program, but elimination program. And here are some of it. You see, I have talked about the phases, public health problem, looking at ONCO as a public health problem, controlling it as a public health problem. Now we are looking at elimination of infection. And what do we mean by that? We want to reduce the infection, the adult worm, to a level where it is irreversibly extinct, irreversibly. It can no longer be able to restart a recrudescence. And the, the, what APOC is doing today is to now uh, work on this sort of framework. The, the current framework of APOC is the three phases to look at the phase one, where they are distributing ivermectin, phase two, when they will stop treatment, phase three, stop treatment, but post-surveillance is also as important as phase one and two. So let's look at what APOC has done since then. APOC has been assessing the decline, of the decline in infection levels towards breakpoints since 2008, 
since we realize that there is zero infection in Kaduna and then in other sites. And also to confirm the, that the breakpoint has been reached. We are not yet there, but phase one is what results I will present to you now. This is Tukuyu Ruvuma regions. The, the dark red colors, as I said earlier, shows the level of endemicity. Very dark means very uh, high endemicity, pre-control. So the pre-control endemicity level in these regions were very high. And now, in 2011, we went back and skin snipped a number of people in those villages. You can see that in some of them, it's already zero infection. On the right-hand side here is the legend. Any, any, um, uh, any round thing that is uh, empty, white, means zero infection, and then, uh, or 20%, you see that many of them have less, either zero infection, particularly in Tukuyu, but in Ruvuma, we still have one or two sites that, that uh, is not quite zero infection. Now, uh, in total, between 2009 and 2011, APOC has undertaken epidemiological evaluations in 31 sites in, the, in 10 countries. And um, we've realized that elimination probably has already been achieved in 12 of those sites, close to elimination in six sites. Uh, nine sites still uh, has some problems. And, and so um, satisfactory progress is being reached in 27 sites, unsatisfactory in four sites. And we realize that in those sites that are not making progress, the problem has always been with supervision, poor coverage, poor reporting by Ministry of Health staff and our partners, and the problem is not from the community. Or that the drugs arrived late when the communities must go to their farms, and so they did not receive the drugs on time and skipped distribution that year. So 12, uh, in 12 evaluated sites, with 4.7 million people, evaluation has been already, elimination has already been achieved, most probably we think. Now, in concluding, elimination is now feasible for river blindness, something that we never, we never thought we would, would be possible in 2002 when we had the big meeting at the Carter Center in, uh, in Atlanta, uh, on onco eradication feasibility, the conclusion of that meeting was that it 's feasible to eliminate onco in the Latin America but not in sub saharan africa today i 'm very proud standing here to tell you that the communities are proving us scientists wrong because <laughs> Now, now uh, and we think that, the, that this is possible because the, the selected volunteers, the CDDs as they call them, administered the correct dosage, ladies and gentlemen. If they did not administer the correct dosage of ivermectin to eligible persons, we would not be talking about elimination. They observed the uh, exclusion criteria, even though we look at them as non-learned people, but it's their health and they care for it and they want to improve their health. So and we are proud that they observed the exclusion criteria. They referred cases of severe adverse events and they maintained high coverage in many of those 34 sites for 10 to 19 years. They collected ivermectin. They planned and managed distribution and this is why we are seeing elimination today. So 76 million people treated with ivermectin annually by trained community distributors empowering the poor to be part of the solution. 1.8 billion tablets distributed, you know, 600,000 cases of blindness being prevented by APOC every year. And the economic rate of return is at 17% according to the World Bank calculation, protecting 200 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, 30 countries, averting 1 million uh, dollars annually. And ivermectin treatment has been scaled up in some of the countries where we are having problems. And that's where we're very happy, we're very lucky that we're getting the Champolimo Award because this award is going to help us in scaling up in Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Chad, to make sure that those countries that are lagging behind 
also improve in treatment coverage because elimination depends on first the endemicity level and then maintenance of good coverage. Over 50 million people received other interventions through the APOC network. And as you saw, 12, uh, 7.4 million people already enjoying the benefits that probably this scourge has been eliminated in their sites. There are six lessons I would like to share with APOC, uh, from APOC with you, ladies and gentlemen. The first being the power of the public-private partnership. I think this is extremely important that this partnership did not limit itself to only the pharmaceutical company, the donors, and the ministers of health, but also welcomed the poor as partners and also gave them the voice. Sometimes they invite even community people to come and talk to them at their board meeting. Empowerment of community in finding solutions to their health can yield huge results. Investing in research and translating research findings into policy have yielded health benefits in, uh, to poor populations. Low vision, skin, uh, severe itching due to onchocerciasis has significantly been reduced by this uh, partnership. Community participation has yielded good results and provided scientific evidence of feasibility of elimination of river blindness from sub-Saharan Africa. And the community-directed intervention, the CDI, truly works in remote areas. And these children would like to ask you, where would we be without APOC? And our thanks to the Champolimo Foundation Award, uh, Vision Award. And I want to thank Dr. Lenore for this award and the jury. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to be again at the ARVO meeting and to reflect on the outstanding contributions to blindness prevention by so many of the participants here today. The relationship between ARVO and Champalimo Foundation has already had a special significance both for the Foundation and for me personally. When we decided in 2006 that we would make a strong contribution towards the alleviation of visual disorders, we were in need of strong partners who could support us and make sure our activities were significant and forceful. In joining the blindness prevention community, we could not have received a warmer, a warmer welcome from the directors and members of ARVO. It is now six years since we were welcomed by Larry Takemoto, who helped us launch the Antoni Champalimo Vision Award. My gratitude to Larry and so many others at Arvo has not diminished in any way over the years, and the support we receive has gone a long way towards helping us establish this award and directing to date 5 million euros into the field of vision research and blindness prevention. Working together with ARVO and the ARVO Foundation to launch developing country eye researcher fellowships to enhance capacity building in the areas of the world where it is most needed has also been a great privilege for Champalimo Foundation. In highlighting our relationship with ARVO, I would like to mention one person who was a great friend and supporter of our foundation, Joan Engel. Joan was a key person for us in our work in this area, and her friendship and professionalism were as inspiring as they were invaluable. She will be missed. This was today 
the fifth Arvo Champalimo lecture. Again, we have the opportunity to reflect on the current state of work in the fight against avoidable blindness and on the quality and determination of the candidates this time for the 2011 Antonio Champalimo Vision Award, the one we are celebrating today. The most recent edition focused on work in the field, particularly in developing countries, in combating visual disorders. We received a record number of candidates, each of which has demonstrated exceptional commitment to this cause. For 2011, as we already know, our international jury panel chose to honor the work of a truly unique partnership, the African Programme for Oncocercaiasis Control. Our jury is chaired, as we all know, by Alfred Sommer, for whom I have no words to thank the exceptional wisdom and dedication always choosing the very best application. It is a very difficult and delicate task indeed. Thank you very much for you and for all the members of the jury. <clears throat> Let us come back to APOC. There can be few, if any, examples of such a successful collaboration effort in public health as the APOC initiative. As Dr. Amazigo has just shown, it has, APOC has a very particular nature and way of working, and ha it has been and is being particularly su successful. Supported by WHO, 19 African countries, the World Bank, many international donor agencies, the pharmaceutical company, Merck, the communities, the communities, as you emphasize so strongly, APOC is a partnership in every sense of the world, of the world. Indeed, in reaching over 70 million people, 75.8, if I was attentive, mostly on remote communities, APOC has achieved remarkable success in protecting millions of people from scourge of river blindness. One million dollars annually could be prevented. It, it is an exceptional achievement indeed. By pioneering the program of community-directed treatment with ivermectin, community-directed intervention now, as I understood. APOC, under the leadership of Dr. Ruccio Ramazigo, has involved many of the world's most isolated and disadvantaged people in the fight against this disease. APOC's work and collaboration with local populations and their community leaders has brought public health to many of those communities and changed the lives of millions. The motivations behind APOC's efforts are encapsulated in the iconic statue situated outside the WHO in Geneva. Dr. Magzigo just showed a picture, a real picture of a situation uh, of, like that which, which is pictured in this statue of a blind man being glad by a child. This poignant portrait of the importance of blindness prevention is a constant reminder of the impact that EPOC has had on so many communities. Today, many children will now not be later on the other end of the stick. At the heart of this outstanding partnership has been a truly remarkable strong woman, Dr. Ruccia Amazigo. It is the driven vision of Dr. Amazigo that has been so instrumental in building the program as it stands now. 
and she, she has been truly one of the key people in blindness prevention in Africa for many years. She first started her work in the Onkosurkaias when, as a lecturer in parasitology, who enthusiastically engaged her class with research and fieldwork, she met another young woman affected by disease. She had been abandoned, that young woman, by her husband due to the stigma of horrible itching and discoloration of the skin caused by onco. This is, as I understand, a common story. Not only did Dr. Amazigo take the treatment and follow-up under her responsibility of that woman, but she decided to research into the social impact of the disease. Her initial research was the motivation for further studies and further work that eventually culminated in WHO-sponsored assembly of a panel of experts whose work led to the inception of APOC. While at APOC, her groundbreaking work on community-directed treatment with ivermectin is empowering communities and women across the continent, not only to fight river blindness and eventually eliminate the disease, as it is now the objective of APOC, but to enable access to health care. The reach and numbers we have just seen today are outstanding achievements. We warmly thank Dr. Amazigos for her, Dr. Amazigos, for her strength and selfless determination and ability to drive good science, assemble experts, bring partners and stakeholders together, and help the communities themselves take care of their destinies. Finally, I'd like to point that Dr. Amazigo's relentless motivation that of taking the best science and research and using it to bring health care where it is most needed is one that is at the very heart of the Champalimo Foundation's work and our new international research and clinical facilities in Lisbon. It is also the driving force of Champalimo Vision Award itself which alternates, as has been said, between recognizes ma recognizing major scientific breakthroughs in the understanding or preservation of vision, subject of the next award of 2012, and outstanding contributions to the alleviation of vision impairment and blindness in developing countries for which APOC and Dr. Amazigo are being recognized today. The award to APOC also brilliantly illustrates the 2012 Arvo Meetings theme, Translational Research. APOC's work has been the constant bridging of scientific discovery and treatment of vision disorders with an incredible involvement, I very much like to say it again, of communities themselves. We were honored at Champalimo Foundation to host Dr. Amazigo in Lisbon for the award ceremony in September last year, and I am delighted and honored that she could join us here today and allow me to once again pay tribute to the outstanding achievements of OIPOC. I have no doubt that our founder, Antonio Champalimo, would have shared this happiness in recognizing such excellence in the area of public health and blindness prevention in Africa, which was very much in his heart. It is therefore my great personal honor to be able to join you today to celebrate the achievements of APOC. Thank you, Dr. Amazigo. We wish you well and hope you will keep inspiring us all with your work and we will keep making a difference and develop Africa to its full potential. Thank you very much.
So let me thank you all for joining us. I, I have to point out two things. I don't believe that I was asked to chair the jury uh, because uh, Antonio Champalimo has Somer in his name. Uh, and I don't think we're related, but there are members of his family who believe that we are. Um, and I, can I go back to the slide before this? Good, terrific. So um, Leonore did not want to, I think, take time to explain to you this extraordinary facility, uh, but I'm going to do it for her, therefore. This is their new uh, research and treatment facility, which is a spectacular work of architecture and an outstanding set of laboratory environment in which to work, which was recognized this year after only a little over a year's uh, existence uh, to be a wonderful place for young researchers uh, postdocs and graduate students uh, to come and begin uh, their work. I'd also point out, because I've learned this over my many visits to Portugal, that it is situated, as you can see there, between the river and the ocean. Uh, that's the Tagus River that goes through Lisbon, and it is at the very site where those early Portuguese explorers, including Vaz da Gama, set out to find uh, the New World. Uh, and that is why I believe Lenore and her board of directors uh, named their center uh, the Center for the Unknown. Uh, we have a reception now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to nominate your colleagues for the uh, Vision Research Award, uh, the nomination is already uh, in for this year. The jury, jury will meet next month. Uh, but there are many good nominations, and as I uh, advise everybody for every jury and award that I happen to be involved with, uh, if you don't get it the first year, keep coming back. Thank you very much.